Okay, it's 10 a.m. Shall we get started? I think we shall. Um, everybody else can come and join us shortly. Uh, welcome to today's seminar on Introduction to Digital Forensics. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself, first of all, which provides some context. Um, if I can get the thing to work, let me see. Oh, look at that. Fantastic. It's got a video and everything. Right, so my name is Matthew Sorrell. I'm a Senior Lecturer in Telecommunications, Multimedia and Digital Forensic Science at the University of Adelaide. I'm also Adjunct Professor of Digital Forensics at the Tallinn University of Technology. I run a private practice as a digital investigations consultant working predominantly with uh, law enforcement and a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but as of the 1st of October this year, I'm also the Honorary Consul of the Republic of Estonia in Adelaide. So I do like to keep busy. Uh, so lots of distractions on my screen today, but that's how it is. So in digital forensic science, I'm currently the scientific advisor to the Four Mobile Project uh, in Europe, um, which is looking at uh, mobile phones from uh, crime scene to courtroom. So very much the, the digital evidence uh, path and a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm the chair of the technical program committee of the 2020 Digital Forensics Research Workshop, APAC, and also I'll be co-chairing next year's conference to be held here in Adelaide. Uh, 2018, I received a high commendation from the uh, UK uh, National Police Chiefs Council for some of my work in developing emerging sources of digital investigation. I'm an invited member of the Interpol Digital Forensics Experts Group, etc., etc. So I've been working in this digital forensic space for some time. But I think unlike uh, where many of you may be thinking about this, I don't actually do a lot of work in incident response type digital forensics. That's not really my space. Um, predominantly, I work in criminal matters. So since 2005 and particularly since 2016, I work with, predominantly with law enforcement, uh, often in early and mid-stage investigation assistance with South Australian police. So they come to me early when they've got digital evidence that they can't um, uh, process themselves or there's some anomalies or there's some level of analysis that needs to be, uh, that needs to be added. Um, particularly working in new and emerging technologies such as wearable devices. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, I can't, of course, show you any real case data because uh, you know, confidentiality and privacy and that sort of thing. Uh, I, work, I also work strongly in the mobile networks, mobile phones area in video processing and analysis and, and also in audio processing. So it's quite a diverse range of things. Um, predominantly, I work in major crime, which is murder and, and um, uh, unlawful death. Um, serious and organised crime, so crime gangs in particular and other areas. Uh, I also deal with sensitive investigations, so areas uh, particularly relating to uh, internal investigations where an independent external expert is needed to analyse materials. Uh, and I have a reasonably diverse range um, um, of uh, clients in that space. So let's think about digital investigation. Predominantly, when we talk about digital forensics in the cybersecurity context, we're really talking about incident response. So incident response, uh, dealing with the fact that you've post hoc had uh, some sort of uh, failure on your system. It might be accidental. It might be a system failure. Uh, these days, often it's a deliberate cyber attack of some kind. Um, and so the digital forensic aspect of that is then getting to the truth, if you like, of what's going on. Um, it's a different space, but it uses the same toolbox as these other areas. So my predominant area is down here in captured evidence from the physical world and criminal space. I do deal with some aspects of cyber crime, uh, which is still that criminal space, but predominantly there are teams that deal with this area particularly. Um, and the important thing about digital investigation is it's not necessarily in response to a crime. It's also in response to accidents. It's also in response to simply um, being able to optimise your systems and having and having a good view uh, of what's going on in your system. So you might call that forensic by design, which is a term that I detest. Um, what a basic forensic by design basically means to me targeted logs in the right place. 
Um, now, by the way, I can't see anybody, uh, so I'm just going to be talking at the camera. Um, if you want to ask me questions, I am monitoring the chat and I'm monitoring the Q&A area as well. Um, I'd much rather do this in a mode of uh, being able to, to see you, but uh, this is how it is. Right, so let's talk a little bit about cybercrime. The problem with cybercrime is it means different things to different people, and those different people depend really on their context. So <laughs> cybercrime is very much a catch-all phrase. Um, was I involved in the Anom Sting operation? Can't talk about that. Um, actually, I can. No, I wasn't, but um, it's possible that I'll be asked to review some of that material later. Um, Cybercrime basically means different things to different people. Um, it can mean denial of service, it can mean ransomware, it means privacy breaches, phishing and insiders and fraud. And there's a whole range of things that we're dealing with in terms of cybercrime. But as a digital forensics person, what I'm left with is not the elephant, but what the elephant leaves behind. And as a consequence, I now need to essentially work with whatever I've got there. Let's just think about cybercrime a little bit more deeply. Cybercrime really breaks down into three dominant areas, what we call crimes against the machine, such as hacking, uh, crimes in the machine, which is effectively holding content that you're not supposed to hold, uh, and crimes using machines, which is predominantly um, financial frauds. Um, in between those things, we do, of course, get those crossovers, uh, particularly financial frauds and sexual exploitation leading to blackmail and um, things like uh, dating fraud. Uh, ransomware is a crossover between hacking and financial frauds and uh, sexual exploitation um, often relates then also to um, uh, spyware. Uh, I am going to just monitor the questions and ask at the end. Um, really good question there, John, but I'm going to leave it for the moment. All right. Um, so that's one aspect of, of digital forensics, which is related to cybercrime and therefore related in some ways to incident response, which can then uh, expand into uh, unexpected behaviours of your system or the need to optimise your system and therefore have some visualisation of what's going on. One of the other dominant areas in this space, and particularly where I fit, is in um, data that is captured digitally as a consequence of physical events. Um, really good example of that, of course, is mobile phone network records uh, and the behaviours of who's talking to whom and communication. Um, but we also deal with wearables. And in this particular example, you can see a setup that we have for reverse engineering the way in which an Apple Watch actually behaves. And one of the questions that I often get then is, well, can't you just ask Apple for their, uh, for their specifications about how the Apple Watch records steps, records activity? And the answer is no, no, you can't. And the reason that you can't is because first of all, it's intellectual property that Apple doesn't want to share. Secondly, it's a complex interworking of different systems and you have to ask the right people the right questions because they basically don't know when they integrate the system together. Thirdly, Apple has designed this for a particular purpose and so they've tested it against a particular scenario that they envisage is the normal usage for their particular device. Um, and a really good example of where that came out is that in the very early stages of the initial Apple Watch device that came out, um, the pulse meter, the, the photoplethysmography uh, green light meter at the back of the watch was particularly poor at dealing with uh, very dark um, pigmented skin and particularly with dark tattoos. And so as a consequence, it was just outside of their design parameters. So it's important that we have a, uh, a process for calibrating and uh, creating a profile of not just the Apple Watch, but other devices, uh, you know, Here's a Fitbit, for example, um, which behaves in a similar but fundamentally different way in terms of how it comes together. So um, here we have an example of where we're doing some calibration testing because uh, we now know that there is a delay which we can measure between when a watch starts recording steps 
and um, when it then um, actually starts to record those steps and there's also a delay when it stops as well. But importantly, we've actually noticed that change over time as Apple has not only upgraded its hardware, but also upgraded its firmware. Right. So let me just focus my attention for the moment on, and I'm hoping this is still, oh, yes, it is still working. That's good. Um, I'm hoping this is still working. Um, on the criminal side of things, some observations that we make um, through my experience with uh, South Australian police in particular is that we are starting to raise the awareness now of crime scene examiners, recognising that they need to identify potential sources of digital evidence early um, without compromising physical evidence um, and actually calling the experts at the right time. Um, for example, I've had a recent case for, uh, well, recent, a five-year-old case now, um, or an ADSL modem wasn't identified at the time. And as a consequence, it was believed for quite a long time that there was no Wi-Fi in the house. Uh, and once I identified that the log said, hang on, there has to be Wi-Fi, looked up the MAC address, contacted the manufacturer, got a photograph of what the device looked like. And then we went through crime scene photographs and went, ah, there it is, right? That box you thought was a set-top box sitting next to the TV, that's actually the ADSL modem that becomes really important. So for the for, so crime scene examiners are now finding this. In the last five years, I've seen digital evidence move from being very prominent to being quite dominant now in a crime scene investigation. We're not only talking phones, wearables, uh, home Wi-Fi, smart devices around the home, CCTV, uh, cars, pretty much anything that's got a computer controlling it now becomes a potential source of evidence that allows us to reconstruct the timeline of a crime scene. Um, even to the point that uh, wearing a, uh, a body-worn vision camera provides us then with uh, evidence, not so much of the way in which the, uh, the, way in which the investigators uh, examine the crime scene, but we can see detail that they don't see as a consequence of watching that video. We now become very accurate. A really good example of that, again, is that I can watch somebody on Body Worn Vision examining a phone. I can then relate that timestamp and I can see that behaviour in, for example, the step count that's coming off a, a, an iPhone. Um, I'm going to talk about standard operating procedures in a moment. Um, I have a problem with standard operating procedures because we're now dealing with a space where the half-life of our knowledge is around about 18 months. In other words, the devices that we're dealing with, about half of them change out every 18 months. Uh, and this means that if you put together a standard operating procedure, it has to be descriptive and provide principles rather than being prescriptive and say, this is precisely how you do this. Because as soon as you get a firmware upgrade, even to that one particular device, it can change everything. Um, the other thing that we've noticed is that um, with most forensic experts, uh, the forensic expert will be given, for example, a DNA sample or some other uh, physical trace evidence and be asked to analyze that evidence and come back with a result. Digital forensics is so rich in the, in the data that it produces that as a consequence, um, we actually start to see um, more questions being raised. So I'll be given, for example, an extraction from a phone that will result in, I also need to see certain types of network records um, that will provide a different, uh, a different perspective. And then I might notice something anomalous such as a Wi-Fi access point that we didn't know about. So finding that and finding that and finding that. Um, so that iterative integration of digital evidence is now becoming uh, a thing. And it means that uh, if I'm brought in early into an investigation, I tend to have quite a lot of back and forth with the investigators um, as the digital evidence raises more questions, requires more evidence, requires more insight and back and forth. Um, and in particular, one of the things that bothers me, I think about digital forensics at the moment, it's a very rapid moving field, et cetera. 
Um, but we're still very much in the enthusiastic amateur stage, particularly when it comes to law enforcement. Um, it's where fingerprints were a century ago. It's where DNA was 30 years ago. The recognition of its potential, some really, really good tools, but often the underlying forensic science, the verification, the validation, the hard testing, the scenario considerations, the alternative um, explanations are missing from the fundamental underlying science. And so that's an area where as an academic, I can afford to spend some time. So let me give you some definitions. Um, first of all, digital trace. So trace evidence at a crime scene is things like bits of ground glass, uh, um, objects that might have fingerprints or DNA on them, uh, fibers, dirt. In um, the digital context, uh, if I extract data off a of mobile phone, um, I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Uh, if I extract data off a of mobile phone, what I'm left with is an enormous dump uh, of files off the phone, many of which are part of the operating system, many of which are uh, applications that have no bearing on our investigation. So they are all digital traces, and we're talking hundreds of thousands, even millions of small files, even on a mobile phone. That doesn't become evidence until those traces have been sorted, analysed, considered, and then delivered back to the investigators to say, this is relevant to your investigation. Now it becomes evidence, right? And that includes an interpretation and an analysis uh, and a justification for why it's relevant to the investigation or why it might be relevant to the investigation. Um, it, is, it is, if you like, the sifted, sorted, analysed and um, interpreted data. So when we talk about digital evidence, we're not talking about everything. Um, it's the stuff that we need to focus on. This is a problem. And the problem that we have is that um, moving from digital trace to digital evidence means that you need to understand context and you need to know why you're looking for certain things and what they're going to be for. So if, for example, you have a computer that's the subject of a murder inquiry, but it turns out there's child exploitation material on that computer, then you don't want to be sidelined by the fact that you now think that you need to be analysing that material when, in fact, all we're looking for is... Uh, for example, timelines of uh, uh, the usage of that computer. So different focus. Um, so that's digital evidence. This is the forensic process. The forensic process is different to the investigation process. And the investigation process is effectively what detectives do. Um, it does get mixed up in the DFIR sort of context because the digital forensics expert uh, also becomes the investigator and the, um, who is interpreting and making recommendations about, for example, attribution. So investigation is the process of discovering the 5W1H, the who, what, where, when, why, and how of getting to the bottom of a particular event, a particular thing that occurred. This is different to digital forensics, which is the application of scientific principles to evidence to test hypotheses or apply other scientific tests in the process of investigation. And where these cross over is that if we are using off-the-shelf tools, which have been calibrated, verified, driven against scientifically validated processes, then we can deliver that evidence into the investigation process. If we have new and new novel um, evidence that we don't yet know how to examine, then we need to actually go back to basics and actually have a look at this from a scientific perspective and say, well, what have we got and how do we know that we can trust it and to what extent? Uh, and this is particularly the case in digital forensics because I mentioned the 18-month half-life of new and original data. That also means that there are new and original data sources coming on board. Really good example of this uh, is that Ray-Bans have recently uh, introduced a stereoscopic, uh, pair of, uh, uh, stereoscopic cameras built into a pair of sunglasses. Um, and we're now looking at what that might mean in terms of um, three-dimensional 
uh, vision being posted to Facebook and whether we can you exploit that open source intelligence to recreate a three-dimensional crime scene. So new technology comes into the market. We want to be able to validate and verify what we can do, partly preemptively, but it's also possible that we'll find ourselves in a situation where that sort of material has, uh, has come up. And now we need to essentially do the processing and validation on the fly while we're also dealing with that case evidence in front of us. So that's digital forensics. It's basically a foundational science, which is then applied in my context into criminal investigation um, and in the context of many of you into an incident response investigation. Now, um, just sticking with criminal for the moment, this is a diagram that we came up with as part of the Formobile project. Um, what are we dealing with in, term, in terms of evidence? When it comes to incident response, Usually you already know where your logs are, where to find them, uh, where the materials are that you're likely to need as a starting point. Now, from there, you may go, you may go deeper if an incident response uh, results in a discovery of, for example, legal content on a, on a machine, you might want to go into a, a deeper uh, investigation. But by and large, your um, acquisition is automatic because you've already, as an authorised examiner to a particular system got access. In a crime scene, we don't have cooperative devices. Uh, there are devices that we don't know about necessarily. There are devices for which the owners won't necessarily give us passwords and so on. So our first responders arrive at the crime scene. Um, they're either responding to an emergency or they're responding to a planned uh, arrest process. Either way, that sets a context for what it is that we're setting out to do. At the crime scene, we identify potential uh, evidence traces, including devices, but also from devices, we can also get passwords. I'll come back to the question about cloud computing shortly. Um, all of this needs to be documented. The evidence needs to be gathered. Uh, it doesn't necessarily get physically doesn't necessarily get physically gathered from the crime scene and taken to a lab because we're now dealing with live systems. For example, you do not want to switch somebody's router off. You um, immediately, what you want to try and do is interrogate that router first and find out, for example, what devices are connected um, and, and establish essentially the, the known state before you switch that off. And similarly with uh, live RAM uh, capture off a, off a computer before you do in fact switch it off. So from there, we go to acquisition. So acquisition is a technical job, and I'll put lab technicians, very well-trained lab technician who is using uh, established processes, um, established protocols, and very often having to make priority choices because inevitably we're now dealing with systems that are not passive. Let's, um, in fact, let me go to this point now and just show you a couple of, couple of toys. Uh, if you like. So I've set up my other camera over here. Hello. Um, this is called a, um, a right blocker or a forensic ultra doc, um, as, as it's been labelled. This is a device that allows me to plug in a hard drive that I've taken out of a laptop, out of an external device, out of an external case, for example, connect that in, and it sits between my workstation and the laptop, uh, sorry, workstation and the, um, and the hard drive. And from there, I'm then able to access this hard drive directly and know that I'm not going to be writing to the hard drive up to a point. There's a couple of issues with this. Um, the first is that we will actually see that there is a power on counter. So we'll see that power on counter show here. The, this device knows that it's been powered on. Um, if we do a sequential um, physical image, so binary level sector by sector image, um, depending on the hard drive, there's a potential risk that we've got anti-forensic software built into the firmware that will identify that that's exactly what's going on and will proceed to spit out garbage to this system whilst at the same time um, potentially just erasing itself in the background. So there's always anti-forensic risks with this, but this is the, the best technique we have right now for accessing a hard drive. So far, so good. What we're supposed to do, 
according to most of the standards, is make a forensic copy of that hard drive. And then and by forensic copy, I mean a bit by bit image um, and verify that and sign it to make sure that we don't get any, any modification to that copy. Keep the original side, work off the copy. Um, that's apparently best practice. The problem is best practice was written in 2006 when a hard drive was up to maybe uh, 10 gigabytes, okay? Um, routinely hard drives are now 500 gig, one terabyte, two terabyte. Uh, the, the workstation that I'm working on here has four terabytes of internal SSD. It has four terabytes of external SSD and it's connected to a 50 terabyte NAS. So I'm dealing with serious quantities of data, which are basically infeasible to image in a timely way. Nevertheless, if you've got a single hard drive, and you've got the time, that's the best thing to do. It's gonna take half a day just to do the imaging, um, but at least you can move on. If you're dealing with emergency incident response and your priority is continuity of business, you probably don't have time to do this. If you're dealing with a criminal lab where you've got twice as many hard drives coming into your lab every day as you're able to image, then something has to give. And so what we're increasingly seeing is that we're relying on this ultra dot type of uh, technique now to triage the data. So to do a statistical scan, first of all, to see if there's anything there that flags our interest that means that we now need to prioritize that particular piece of evidence. And that becomes necessary. So that's one little toy. The other toy that I'd like to show you is how we analyze a phone. And this has changed very much um, over the last 20 years. When we started thinking about phone forensics, so just a little iPhone here, little one of my older ones. Uh, when we started thinking about phone forensics, what we were extracting was your call list, your text list, your contact list. A lot of that information was on the SIM card anyway. And um, the result of this is that we were dealing with a fairly large diversity of devices. And as a consequence, if you're in a situation where you can be licensed to operate one of these systems, I have, as you can see here, a fairly diverse range of connecting to the camera back a bit for you to see. Diverse range of connectors for a large variety of phones. In practice today, um, I'm dealing almost entirely with Android and iPhones. So with iPhone, I've only got three different connectors. Um, with Android, I've really only got two or three as well. So pretty much everything is USB, USB-C, micro USB, uh, and Apple Lightning and the old Apple connector. Um, so I don't really need all of those connectors, but I do have them available to me. Um, that then comes with software. This is the XRY software, which I'm licensed to use. Um, XRY, uh, the, the, the company that makes it, MSAB, Microsystem H and AB, and Swedish company is a partner in, in Four Mobile Project, which is why I have access to their rather expensive licensed kit. Um, the way this works, fairly simply, uh, let me see if I can just get that to you. As you can see, this is an air, well, I would normally have this as an air gap machine. I don't right now. It's just too hard to link into the Zoom as well, so I'm not going to bother. Uh, but if I now extract. This is very much designed to be a plug and play type of operation. Connect, unlock the phone. In this particular case, I happen to know the password, which by the way, happens to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Good for us. Um, trust this computer, trust. And I think this is an A1453, that will do. So I'll tell it as an A1453, and I'm now going to do a logical full read. So here's one of the key differences here is that old school digital forensics, we could do passively. In other words, you have a memory that you're not actively working with. Um, you can't do that with, a, with a, a smartphone because the smartphone essentially inserts itself um, and its operating system between the interface and the um, and, and the phone memory. So you can't generally do a physical memory dump. Uh, I haven't even mentioned encryption yet. 
Um, so logical full read, everything and go. And uh, let's just call this Cyber Week. And normally I protect this with a password, but I won't bother today. And what we now have is effectively a plug and play system. Right. So this is acquisition. The next aspect of this is analysis. And part of that analysis is once again, plug and play, which deals with the 90% of criminal cases. So relatively simple things like finding messages about selling drugs, for example, doesn't require a lot of effort, doesn't require a lot of expertise. I don't generally get involved in those sort of cases because they're quite straightforward. I get involved in the tricky ones. Um, so, but that level of analysis is then by, done by data specialists. And from there, we go to our detectives. And what often happens then is that we have a loop here of the inquiry comes back with more questions, which comes back to more analysis, which comes back to more questions until eventually we develop a sufficient understanding of the evidence that we can produce a brief. The brief goes to some form of evaluation. Now, in the criminal context, that's uh, the prosecution will now examine that brief to determine whether there's sufficient evidence for charges to be brought forward. But you might also think about that in the context of incident response. If it turns out to be an internal attack or an external attack, we need to make a decision at some level of executive appointment to ask the question, um, do we have enough here to approach one of our employees about what they've done on our system? Um, or alternatively, um, this is a criminal act that's come from outside of our systems. Um, do we want to pursue uh, attribution to somebody uh, or is it enough for us to focus our attention on simply patching our um, uh, attack surface that, that was penetrated, um, fix everything up, put in place more monitoring and then just move on because we're not going to be able to find who that is. And these are legitimate questions in that evaluation. Um, and from there, we come to a decision. Lots of good questions coming up. I'm going to uh, uh, make sure I have time to answer them as well. So the decision could be in front of a court, but it could also be a boardroom decision. It could be a human resources decision level as well. Uh, it really just depends on what you're dealing with here. It could simply be a local IT decision level as well. It's simply that uh, doesn't require any further uh, escalation. Uh, it might just be that somebody's put in the wrong type of hard drive and the hard drive's failed prematurely. That sort of thing can happen as well. Importantly, um, from there, our legal, we, we then build our framework. The framework comes back to our development, review, and evaluation of processes and requirements and procedures. Now, I'm going to start answering some of those questions implicitly um, through what I'm going to have to say. So, one of the things that we see now, uh, and uh, just to give you, we are, you can't really see that, that particular camera. It re oh, there we go. Might behave itself a little bit better now, um, but you can see that we are continuing there. Um, the digital forensic specializations, the first one is white hat hacking. So this is basically how do you break into a device that might have passwords, it might have backdoors, it might have malware that you need to be able to break into. Um, you might have anti-forensic techniques at the front end of it. Uh, Samsung phones, for example, have a thing, called, a thing called NOX, which essentially identifies that you're trying to break in by inserting a bootloader and jettisons part of its memory or might jettison, uh, for example, its uh, uh, encryption key back. Uh, a lot of this is hard. Uh, and some, uh, Julie has asked, do you get many encrypted devices that you can't get anything out of? And the answer is, yeah, quite often. Uh, getting through passwords, finding encryption. Um, one of the great advantages of then buying an off-the-shelf system like this XRY system is that uh, a lot of that encryption is more obfuscation. Um, and as a consequence, if you, if you follow the processes, the keys are in place. And so we can, for example, even though we can't see your uh, the payload of your signal or telegram communications between two devices as they communicate with each other, the um, version that is on your memory uh, 
on your phone, we may be able to read directly through deobfuscating whatever encryption is in place. Uh, sometimes we can't, sometimes people get a bit careless and we end up with a screenshot of your communications as well. So uh, encryption is a hard problem. Whole of, uh, whole, whole of hard drive SSD memories are hard problems as well. Uh, and so it is becoming increasingly difficult. And so this white hat hacking um, is becoming increasingly important I don't consider this to be forensics as such. I consider this to be acquisition. Um, but it's an area where there is science needed, where there is research needed, where there is ongoing development needed to be to essentially be able to uh, bypass the security locks that are put in place. Um, so to put that in context, I don't consider this to be forensics in the same way that I don't consider the ability to be able to uh, use a lockpick to be forensics. That's part of access into a, into a crime scene. Um, and it's no disrespect to the um, really hard work that goes into this level of acquisition. Um, Imaging. So I've talked about securing bit exact copies of hard drives and larger scale memories, but we're also increasingly limiting ourselves just to logical extractions. And with a logical extraction, you don't see, for example, deleted files, you don't see um, slack space, you don't see unoccupied space, um, which is often where you will find that um, some materials can, uh, can be hidden, particularly around malware. Um, file system analysis, uh, which many of you, I'm sure, are, are expertise in, have expertise in. Um, network log and transaction records analysis. Now, this can mean one of two things. For most of you, that's probably um, IP, IP and, and LAN Ethernet traffic. For me, this is predominantly mobile phone network traffic. Um, live data capture, which is a different matter. So this is really about interception uh, and, and live intercept. And very importantly, tool validation. So tool validation. Um, is, is a really important aspect. And it's as subtle as things like um, a tool like this, which I find to be very good. Um, how do I know that it's interpreted timestamps correctly? How do I know that um, it's extracted um, every column in an SQLite database that's going to be useful to me? Um, how do I know that when I ask it to do a search on a keyword that every version of that keyword has been found? Uh, and in particular, what happens if that keyword uh, jumps across sectors um, in memory. Um, so the, this starts to become a hard problem, again, to be able to validate that your tool is doing exactly what you expect it to do. In my case, um, I often write my own software, my own tools, uh, because that way I know that I can trust what I'm doing, but I'm writing it for a very specific bespoke process. I'm not trying to write it for a general process. Wow, let's move on. Cloud forensics, question about cloud forensics. Um, we're really dealing with, with um, two key different ideas. One is static storage. So the idea that you've got your iCloud or your Dropbox account. Um, and the other is that you've got dynamic instantiation of virtual machines. So in this particular case, cloud forensics, not an area that I work in. Let me be very clear about this. Um, but if you've got a, a, a virtual server on, on somebody's cloud somewhere, out there um, and you need to do that analysis, then you've got a combination then of, of getting both the, the storage services as well as if you like the live memory and the live uh, uh, status of that particular machine. Now, if you've got a contractual relationship between your service provider as a private sector company uh, to be able to do that, that's all well and good. You've simply got a really big digital forensics uh, incident response problem that you're gonna have to deal with. Um, if you're law enforcement, uh, you've got significant cross-border legal challenges because you're now dealing with um, the fact that I can't just take your password and log into your Gmail account and read your mail. Um, even as a law enforcement officer, I can't do that. Um, there are things like I can sit down with you next to you at your phone and I can scroll through you, with your permission uh, your uh, your Google timeline history, your um, and so on, which is information that is stored in a cloud server that is now being accessed through the front end. Um, but if I need to get that information out of Google, out of Facebook, out of Apple, out of Amazon, um, then that normally requires a warrant process um, and then that has to work internationally, which requires international agreements um, and it can take months. 
uh, and that can be a very difficult and frustrating process. Um, we do find that the service providers will jump to attention when we're dealing with uh, a clear and emerging threat to life, uh, in particular if we're dealing with a missing person, uh, then, then we do get significantly greater cooperation. But of course, um, it has to be a genuine threat to life to be able to get that cooperation. Um, what else are we dealing with? I deal predominantly also in multimedia forensics, so image authentication and analysis, and that means being able to um, uh, interpret not just image content, but metadata, being able to look for defects, being able to look for examples of forgery. Uh, I had an example recently where I was presented with four photographs uh, as evidence in a, in a civil matter. Um, and these had been extracted forensically using Celebrite. Um, yes, thanks, John. Um, using Celebrite similar to XRY. Um, but what I noticed when I examined the metadata of the file was that the file structure was different, the uh, thumbnail was different, and when I investigated back further, I discovered that the, the SHA hash on that particular file was different to what had been extracted. And it looks like at some point um, between the extraction and the delivery of that evidence to the defence, somebody opened the opened the image, maybe rotated it by 90 degrees, saved it again, and that's what got delivered. And as a consequence, we now had corrupted evidence, uh, which meant that that particular image was not admissible. But more importantly, it meant that there was evidence of disruption of the chain of evidence process, which then led in part to um, the dismissal of that particular case. So video processing and analysis, once again, very important for things like uh, identifying timing, uh, being able to identify objects, um, being able to analyze that sort of material. So just to put that into perspective, the computer that I'm sitting at right now, which you can see, let me reflect it back at you. So this is, this is very, very poor lighting there, but this is a um, very high end, recent uh, 5K iMac with the anti-reflective screen, and it means that I can see a lot more in a, uh, in a video or image than, than your normal punter. Uh, and so from there, I can, I can then focus my attention on what needs to be, uh, what needs to be uh, found. Um, lots of good questions coming through. Let me just keep moving on quickly. Digital evidence law is really, really important because um, it's an entire other subject. The law is not keeping up. Um, and there is an expectation that you'll get a straight answer um, out of evidence um, when, in fact, we're now dealing with a situation where the, uh, the evidence that we're dealing with is subject to constant changes. Um, cryptocurrency, another example of financial frauds. Uh, are entirely different areas. So um, forensic accounting, uh, dealing with financial for dealing with cryptocurrency, where the evidence you're dealing with is digital, but you're not so concerned about that being, if you like, esoteric computer logs, so much as it's specific accounting detail that is now held in some sort of appropriate financial database. I don't deal with that. Malware analysis, specifically looking at the implementation of software, another specialist area. Um, sex crimes, another specialist area, partly because of the content, but very much because of the legal context and the psychological impact of dealing with that space. Um, also important is, and, and legitimate, is the psychology of criminals and victims. Let me add to that the psychological impact that some of this work has on investigators as well. So let's have a little think about digital forensic tools and, and the digital forensics process. Uh, we need to deal with impartiality. Um, we need to deal with confidentiality. So um, somebody asked earlier that um, what are the considerations here? And it's a really important point because digital evidence is very, very personally invasive in a way that your DNA content potentially is, but isn't really, right? Um, if I have your phone, I have your pattern of life. I know who you talk to. I know why you talk to them. I know what you've said. I know when you've said it. Um, I have insight into your fantasies. I have insight into your um, 
sexual interest, let's put it that way, and so on and so on. So it's a deeply invasive, and deeply personal space. Um, I'm not a law enforcement officer, so generally speaking, um, it's not appropriate for me to see that up front. That information comes to me under the circumstances that it's necessary for that deeper level of analysis, in which case I'm authorised by virtue of the detective in charge requiring that additional level of information, as a consequence of which I then have applications to keep that private, to keep it secure, to keep it off the network. Um, and so as a consequence, um, this is why effectively I have very large scale offsite storage uh, here to be able to deal with that information. Auditability, the processes that I use need to be auditable. This um, infuriates judges sometimes because I provide a level of technical detail in a report that they don't know and don't care about, but that's not the point. The information that I need to, to hand over, if I'm not using a prior prescribed process, and keep in mind, if, if evidence comes to me, that's generally the case. Um, then, um, I need to be able to provide sufficient information that my process can be audited by a competent independent expert, usually for the other side. Um, it needs to be repeatable. So similar, similar thing, I should, I should be able to describe what I do so that the other side can take the same evidence, the same process and replicate what I did do, or and also reproducible. So if I can find a different way of analysing the same evidence or a different source of evidence to cross correlate, that's really important to be able to provide confidence in the evidence that I'm now analysing. It also needs to be justifiable, right? So um, justifiability means that you need to understand what your questions are and what your permissions are about what you're dealing with. These are compromised decisions of triage and priority and focus. Um, there are, for example, if, we, if we've uh, seized assets from a lawyer, then there's legal privilege, which means that there are certain evidence areas that we're not allowed to go into because of legal privilege. I have a similar issue here because the room that I'm in right now technically is a consulate. And so there are parts of my office that are outside of the jurisdiction of local law enforcement. So um, justifiability becomes now not just those areas of can and can't, but also the idea of triage. If you go down a particular path because of a particular issue, it might be that you're dealing with missing persons. So the priority is speed rather than um, a speed to save a life. And that might come ahead of accountability um, and uh, attribution of who's responsible for the crime. Um, fairly extreme case, but it's surprisingly common. So you need to document why you did certain things a certain way. Um, the other thing that happens is mistakes do get made. Uh, and if you've documented properly, then you can understand why certain things happened. Uh, and they may simply be mistakes, but at least you understand uh, what occurred and why. And that may diminish, but shouldn't uh, eliminate the power and the relevance of that evidence. Chain of custody. Now, chain of custody is commonly what I see being meant by digital forensics in the incident response space. And this isn't a fair statement, but it is commonly what people think we mean, which is that documentation of chronology of movement, um, looking at the system, what state was it in when it arrived, what did I do when it was in my custody, how did I seize it again, uh, or how did I seal it again. So uh, this is predominantly not a digital process. This is a evidence bag and documentation process. Um, so um, there's a lot of administration associated then with the digital forensics process. Now, I promised that I'll talk about the NIST framework. Um, so let me do so. Um, NIST 886 is called the Guide to Integrating Forensic Techniques into Incident Response. Now I like the title because it talks about forensic techniques into incident response. It doesn't say that digital forensics is incident response. And the other thing is that it recognises that digital forensic science is, an, is a lower level scientific foundation from which we get the digital forensics processes of which one application is, in its, is incident response. It's not the only space where we see digital forensics. So notice once again, the need for policies, support the reasonable and appropriate use of forensic tools, procedures and guidelines, and education. They're the key outcomes from that particular 
uh, document. The problem that I have with this document is that it was last updated in 2006. And so it makes certain assumptions about the state of technology. And as a consequence, it locks itself into a mindset which is now obsolete. In 2006, we didn't significantly have, significantly have um, cloud services. We didn't significantly have smartphones. We didn't significantly have really large scale hard drives. We didn't have significantly large numbers of large scale hard drives. So what's missing from this document are questions of priority and triage and uh, legal jurisdiction across international boundaries and so on. So this is these are it, it's not a criticism that the document um, missed it. It's just they weren't there. Um, the guidelines give us this technique of collection examiner at collection, examination, analysis, and reporting. And implicit in that, it says essentially you can get access to the data, you can examine it, you can take a file, you can determine that it's an SQLite database or whatever sort of log it is or a JPEG file, and you can examine it. You can then analyze that and interpret its significance, and then you can report it. And in an incident response context, that might be okay. But what's missing from here? In my view, it's this. The document doesn't really talk about context and authorization and proportionality, right? If I have an incident response issue with somebody's computer, I shouldn't at the same time be looking to see whether they're violating copyright on, on videos that I downloaded, for example. So proportionality and authorization is important. The collection process requires preparation. In other words, this shouldn't come out of the blue. You should actually already have your processes in place. Your tools should be in place. They should be validated. You should understand how to use them. Your analysis needs to be focused on the issue at hand and your report needs to be relevant. And you also need to take into account confidentiality. So as you can see, it's a relatively large scale um, area that, that requires quite a bit more uh, context. Um, right. If you're interested in the process that we're dealing with with 4Mobile, so 4Mobile looks specifically at mobile phones. What I'll really uh, appreciate about a mobile phone, if I ask you now, um, and we won't have time to answer here, but if you think about what a mobile phone is, most people will say, well, it's a handheld computer. And actually, it's a handheld, battery-powered, very powerful smart computer that contains a suite of sensors that tells me where you are, how you move, how you behave. It's a window into your cloud services. It's your communication system. Um, it effectively records your pattern of life, your behavior, and to some extent, your innermost secrets. So, um, the, you know, so, the, so creating processes then that deal not only with the technical process of accessing data and then analyzing it, but also recognizing that there are limits to what we should be able to do and the privacy associated with that. And it's hard, right? Because if I say certain date ranges, all that's in scope. Um, some logs aren't date stamped. Um, some can be identified by virtue of where they sit between two other date stamped uh, systems. It's quite possible to change the clock in a phone. So therefore we now have uh, evidence that's outside of the time range, even though it's relevant. Um, so this is a challenging problem to be able to respect privacy as well. And of course we're doing that this in Europe through the context of um, the general data protection regulations, the GDPR regulations that exist um, in Europe. Um, I do have an example, which I'm actually not going to give you because I don't have time, but I just want to focus on one issue, which is when. We talk about who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, everything else is important, but most important, frankly, is to understand the order of things, right? Um, when did things occur? In what order did they occur? Um, when I have two or three or more devices in a complex integrated system, how do I know that I've got cause and effect going on? And that comes down to time. And uh, very, very quickly, um, the good news is that in a modern network system, we have uh, synchronized clocks either through GPS or, or uh, uh, an IP uh, internet-driven clock reference. Almost always we're dealing with something that is based on UTC, so universal coordinated time, uh, which I won't go into detail here, but suffice it to say, UTC is not quite as simple as you think um, because it's um, 
effectively a fabrication around what the actual time is, plus or minus one second, plus leap seconds, etc. cetera. Um, there are implementation dependent variations on how leap seconds are implemented. So that becomes another challenge potentially because we are now dealing with seconds and millisecond sort of variations in our records. Um, Unix Epoch is great, but we're also dealing with Apple Cocoa Core data, almost, but not quite the same thing. Excel has a weird system based on competing with Lotus 123 in the 1980s and then getting 1900 wrong as a leap year. Um, so things get strange from there. We have all these different types of formats. And so even recognizing that you have a date stamp requires some experience because your uh, machine learning tools aren't necessarily going to get that right either. And then there's daylight savings. Um, and the various time zones that we have here. Now, being in Adelaide, one of the best things about being in Adelaide, see, there is something, is we're in a half hour time zone, which means that if you've got ambiguities in your time zones, then they stand out because we're now half an hour off here. So if I'm looking at mobile network records, for example, where uh, gateways are in the Eastern States, I will see records relating to the same event timestamped half an hour apart because part of that occurs in South Australia part of that recurs in Victoria and New South Wales. So that becomes fun as well. I might just final example there is that that level of experience and understanding of the system that you're dealing with should not be underestimated. So if you're an, in you're an incident response digital forensics expert in your system, it's really important that you understand the subtleties and the complications that can arise in your system. You probably don't have time to be a generic expert across the board. So one of my main specializations is understanding the subtleties of Telstra Optus and Vodafone and how their network records, their billing system records and their signaling records um, are, have been adapted, how they work subtly, the impact that that has. And an example of this is that what time a phone call starts really deals with a whole range of uh, questions there. Now, I'm going to stop my presentation there because I've only got three minutes left. Um, I will just show you if you can see there that I've now managed to capture this data. I don't have time, you can't even see it, so it doesn't really matter. Um, what I have there is a plug and play type of system. Let me stop sharing the screen and then I can uh, come back to you uh, in front of you. There have been a few questions. Um, first of all, on the Q&A, were you involved in cross-national ANOM sting operation? The answer is no, not directly. Um, is social media data collection part of the acquisition process? Yes, absolutely. But we can't do that by logging into somebody's social media account. We can see what's been posted in the public domain, so open source intelligence. Um, we can also uh, access your social media through the device that you used uh, by effectively asking permission. Have I had to deal with deep fake images? Um, I have a presentation. If you look up my name in deep fake, you'll see a presentation I gave in the US to the Strategic Operations Command a couple of years ago about deep fake. Deep fake questions come up often. Um, claims that this this video isn't really mean you've managed to deep fake all of my tattoos and, and piercings on my face for a 15 minute video involving me threatening children um it, i've never been in a situation where i've been confronted with what's been claimed to be a deep fake where there's any basis for that to come forward so this is quite quite important because deep fake gives you the impression that you can fake anything i often deal with uh photoshopped images um really easy to do, but also really easy to detect. The metadata doesn't stack up. There's quite a lot of publications that we've, that we've done in that space. Right, some other questions that have arisen. Uh, John, how's, how's your role changed with the growth of cloud computing? So somebody capturing data from cloud servers? Okay, because I deal with criminal forensic analysis rather than with capture, this is basically not my problem. Um, somebody else does the capture. The biggest issue that I have is making sure that that's been captured pro appropriately with the appropriate level of metadata. One of the tools that we have that we've developed uh, is around uh, capturing SnapMap and Snapchat 
materials as a form of open source intelligence, which we've shared. You can look me up as well there uh, on a system called, what do we call that, um, Ghost Protocol, um, where we make sure that we capture the metadata so that we are actually able to pinpoint what we've got, where we've got it from, where and and its provenance. So that becomes important. Um, but the jurisdictional issues are not an area that I have to deal with. Uh, what software do I prefer? I use MSOB software because it's been provided to me rather than Celebrite. Um, otherwise, I don't do I don't do the capture. Um, I'm mostly dealing with hard drives full of pre-captured material. Um, generally speaking, if it can, if the work can be done with NCASE, then it's not saying it's going to come to me because that's sufficient. Um, I deal with hard problems, and so I go, I dive into databases, I dive into binaries. Um, for forensic experts who do some of their work for law enforcement, what formal legal and ethical frameworks apply to the work done? Uh, that's, a new, that's a question for an entire other conference. Uh, at the moment, I simply have to, pres I simply have to um, work legally, be satisfied that uh, I have permission being signed off um, and uh, not share personal and private data. Um, but it, it's a gap in law. Uh, what is the pathway to employment in digital forensics? A uh, really good question. Um, I teach a course in mobile phone network forensics. Um, there are master's courses and master's majors that we can have in this space. I'm currently working with a university here to try and uh, create a, uh, a bachelor's uh, degree in digital forensic science to mirror um, both biological and chemical uh, forensic science. Do I get many encrypted devices? Uh, they don't normally get that far to me, but sometimes uh, we can often do um, at least some traffic analysis, even if we can't see payload. A device manufacturers cooperative when it comes to law enforcement, or you have to do everything from scratch. A little bit of both. Uh, sometimes they're cooperative. Uh, some make a great noise about not being cooperative, but in any case, you still have to verify and validate everything that you see. Image authentication must mean you're a fan of NFTs. Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> Is there a way to know what the content is in the multimedia photo or video? Yeah, um, the, uh, in the case of child exploitation material, there is a, a system called Photo DNA developed by Haney Farad, who's a book um, which allows investigators in that space to be able to match images, even if it's not the same binary file, to known images in a database. Um, it's also possible to do some machine learning against, uh, against imagery. But that's really a triage issue rather than a, a, a knowledge issue because you're now relying on a machine to interpret that information. This area is fraught with uh, legal and ethical issues, of course. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I don't have to deal with that particular uh, space. Um, and, and even if I did, then the techniques that I'd need to deal with with uh, uh, data protection would be dialed up another level. Well, the instruction process for information after investigation is completed. So a couple of things here. Um, the, um, if the information has been provided to me, um, I either ret uh, on a physical medium, I return the medium. Um, if I'm dealing with material that is relatively small that I have to deal with uh, for processing, I'll, I'll process it on an external hard drive. I'll then uh, hand, I, I'll either hand over that hard drive uh, or if I do it on a USB, I'll hand it over on a USB memory. Um, and the answer to your question there is recognizing that I often work, walk out of office works with literally bags of USBs. Um, for me, use one's memories. Um, and rather than um, deleting them, they actually go through my shredder. Um, I also need to be careful about uh, what gets backed up onto my systems as well um, and make sure that I don't retain long term. However, I do need to be, uh, I do need to deal with long term uh, storage because the data that I'm dealing with uh, may not go to trial for four or five years. And so as a consequence, I do actually have a long, a long term storage archive that's needed. Um, what if the evidence is tampered while transferring from source devices? This can happen. Um, I've had a device that decided that it belonged to me because it had never been backed up before. Um, so that wasn't so much that it was tampered with so much as the extraction process uh, introduced a feature. Um, 
So we need to be careful around this. There are anti-forensic processes that can get in the way. Usually they become self-evident. Um, in other words, what you get is garbage uh, or something very obvious. Um, tampering in a way that is very subtle, so it introduces uh, a feature that, that misleads as opposed to destroys evidence uh, is much, much harder to deal with in practice. Um, but this is very much what we're concerned about with uh, transferring from source devices. And it means that, okay, another example of the phone um, is that we put the phone into flight mode, for example, we make sure that it's not connected to the network. The problem with iPhone at the moment is that when you go into flight mode, uh, you've still got Wi-Fi switched on unless you explicitly switch it off. You've still got Bluetooth switched on unless you explicitly switch it off. And if you've got an iPhone in the vicinity, um, it may use the Bluetooth connection to passively instruct a phone to delete itself while it's off network. So um, these become um, a problem. Say you're granted warrants, court orders for legal assistance already. How do you get around international jurisdictions from obtaining data? Um, this relies on international treaties. It relies on, for example, the UNODC, International Intergovernmental Experts Group on Cybercrime, um, has a number of conventions related to international cooperation. Uh, the UK and the US have a, a cooperation agreement between them so that they can share. Um, big tech, Apple and Facebook, et cetera, do have protocols in place, but they're outside of the scope of what I deal with. Um, they're areas where I can advise uh, police to go through the proper channels. Um, and sometimes it's timely and sometimes it's not. The SANS and GIAC certifications overrated or underrated, um, they're okay. They're good, they're good operational uh, work and they'll handle the 90%. As an academic, I don't see that level of work, right? Um, it's below the threshold of what I deal with that doesn't delegitimize these things at all. It means that if you can't handle the 90% with that level of certification and experience, then it comes to me. Have I ever been hacked? Yeah, yeah, well, lots of attempts. Um, the easiest way to get through the defences of an academic is to uh, appeal to our ego um, and, um, you know, dear professor, I'm interested in this publication and you send me a bogus link to the university library and the next thing you know, you've got my password. So um, the answer is yes. Yes, I've been hacked. Um, the secret here is to recognise that you're probably going to be hacked and as a consequence, you put in place an awareness uh, that that may happen you put in place uh, backups and redundancies in your systems, and you also um, don't try and cover that up. As soon as you realise you've been hacked, you contact your, um, your IT services and you tell them that you've been hacked and it's probably part of something bigger, so that's important. Uh, let me give you my personal email. Uh, very happy to take your questions uh, offline. Um, very happy to uh, see you. I hope that's that's been informative for you. Um, it's a bit of a rush to go through so much. It's such a diverse field, uh, but uh, and there's so much happening here. Um, the um, Tabitha, I can't actually answer that question because I'm not the one that I'm working for at the moment. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yes, can I share? I think I did just share my email in the chat, did I not? I did not. Let me try sharing that to everybody, everyone. All right. There we go. That's the easiest one. Uh, but if you just Google me, um, find me on LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest way to, to do that. Um, and uh, if you just remind me that you came to this session, then that uh, allows me to link you into my network very quickly. Why Estonia? Um, really good question. Cybersecurity. Um, we are dealing there with uh, Russia as, a, as an aggressive uh, neighbour. Uh, historically, the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defence Centre of Excellence is based in Tallinn. Um, and as a consequence, they just have really world-leading cybersecurity operational knowledge um, and uh, the most extraordinary digital ecosystem for, for government and, and society. So 
Um, I love going there, love being there. And as I mentioned, as a consequence, because of that business relationships that I have in Estonia and in South Australia, uh, I've now been appointed as a local honorary consul. Yeah, so um, that's a great link as well. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you. Um, absolutely, Craig. Love Tallinn. Um, it's been a pleasure seeing you. Well, it's been a pleasure talking. I didn't see anybody, but I've had lots of chat. The chats kept me kept me working. Thanks, everyone.